Hey guys, it's Brothers Wisp here at uh, Wisp America. Um, got Kernak, Hammett, Miller, Talamites. It's really good to be around. I guess. I don't know. What did you find that was interesting? You first time. Yep. Um, I'm looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. I, I think the biggest thing I found at this conference was QGIS. I think that's going to be a big big thing that we're going to implement in our, in our, um, in our processes. Um, it's an open source GIS software that allows you to load up KVMs and subscribe to other feeds and do, I guess, interactive map stuff. Okay. Draw circles around certain areas and see what, what addresses fall within that, that kind of thing. So yeah, there was a couple um, like sessions I think that were people were talking about GIS. The last Please. one of the day actually had one that okay. uh, our service manager uh, Lane was in and got a lot of good information from that. Okay. On that pro product, and they were talking about it pretty extensively. So. Okay, so when you're trying to bring products in and use them. What I've struggled with sometimes has been getting people excited about it. Yeah. And like getting them on board. Uh, what do you think for QGIS brought, we bring brought Lane on it? Uh, it's like the selling point that you're gonna bring for the company. Hmm. I, I think Scott, our owner, was pretty excited about it more than even Lane. Um, because he would be able to qualify quotes based on KVMs from other fiber vendors that we have, um, you know, loaded in there, be able okay. to qualify links and be able to reply within five minutes of receiving a request for service. So that's that's what he was so mostly excited about. I think Lane was excited about just knowing uh, what was where and what the fiber circuits were that we had and that kind of thing for 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 field support service needs. So cool. Well, Mike, what did you find that was interesting? Um, I'd say that, like, for most shows, um, why I go is the conversation in the hallway um, or whatever. Like, I only spend 10 minutes in sessions. Yeah. You're welcome in the whole week. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, uh, it was the last session of the day. I just got in uh, 10 minutes into a time. He's like, hey, I need help. Um, so off I went, but uh, but no, it's um in terms of the products and whatnot. Usually that's uh, something I'm already familiar with. Nothing horribly new. This this show, no major announcements that I've heard about anything that's groundbreaking or different. <laughs> yeah, there's no Toronto release. You know, there's no uh, well, they can't even announce their uh, fiber product. The XGS spawn stuff. It, yeah. 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 Um, they had demo units or units that looked like they would work. <laughs> but the, the, the O and T was really, really basic. Like it was an Ethernet port and an uh, SCS APC port, and that was it. Mm -hmm. I was like, well, that's that's all you need, I guess. So uh, it looks looks nice enough. It's not the you no know, ubiquity. Uh, it's a uh, it's a, I was asked to, uh, to talk to him about, about that probably back in August or September, but I don't have the time. Yeah. Um, but um, then, you know, they, there, was, there was vendors there that weren't at previous shows, uh, but those vendors, uh, you know, they didn't have anything groundbreaking that I can think of. It was just like they had more of the same stuff everybody else had. Or just a tangent from it, you know. You know, uh, Tom was what was really excited about uh, one of the uh, ONT manufacturers that was kind of open, you know, open access. So they could work with anything. Um, That's the the Howland or H A L Y N. Yeah, how how Yeah, they're based out of Poland. They were pushing that open OLT dot com yeah. product, which is supposed to work with anything. That sports tier sixty nine, I think. Yeah, it's tier sixty nine and has a um, also API. So their their stuff, they have uh, a REST API. Yeah. That they support, and so that will interact with that and can control everything. So 
I don't know. It looks interesting. I think you grabbed one of their Jeepon on a stick thing. Yes, I did. They have like a OMT on a stick that you that's basically, from what I can tell, running OpenWRT, and it has a VLAN on the SFP side that you can get in for management purposes. The o- seem, seem kind of cool. OMT or OLT? NT. That's it. Okay. Termination. So CPE ver- version of it. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, it's up. Um, I think we probably have. Yeah, yeah. those were zone. Yeah, we have a pile of them sitting there. We've never. Some yeah, a lot of vendors have them. You know, but how do they work and sure. what capabilities they have? Like, this is actually you can do routing on it. And, yeah. And NAT, but I don't know if you would want to do it on there. It doesn't seem like it has a very powerful CPU. But who knows? It's, it's That's a, why you get them and evaluate it. Yeah, yeah. The zones is basically there's there is no way to access it other than through OMCI provisioning. Like there's no, you know, there's no web interface, no SSH, no nothing. There's no routing. It's, it's a bridge only device, and you just program it via OMCI. Mm-hmm. Which, uh, for those that know, OMCI is like the GPON standard for uh, talking from the OLT, which is the like the access point of the GPON world, to the ONT, which is the CPE. Yeah. Okay, you connect. What was interesting? Much similar to Mike, I walked around but didn't see anything that's super new. I think a lot of the industry right now is waiting for 60 Hz and for the, 60. Yeah. 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 and for the newer wireless protocols to you know get standardized and yeah. So it feels like it's a little bit of an in-between moment between fre- frequencies, between protocols, mm-hmm. between so probably a lot more new innovation and new products to come as soon as all of that is standardized and figured out. Would you, um, did anyone go, uh, who's the manufacturer for the 60 gigahertz for ubiquity? Procura? Uh, Perserio, Persero, Pers- Starts with a P and ends with an O, I just don't remember. Yeah, yeah, they were here and apparently their uh, uh, agreement with ubiquity were Ubiquity was the only maker of their products that was based out of the United States. I don't know what their agreement was, but it ended back in October. And so they were trying to push push people that were using their products. Uh, the it's odd that they would come to mostly an ISP based show and not a manufacturer show. Yeah. So they had uh, Tear to Tachyon Tachyon Networks, uh, their 60 gigahertz stuff. Which I've seen before, and I think I've seen advertised on a few of the WIS channels on Facebook and such. Um, I know I got a couple emails from them. Um, they had that uh, device, and then another device, and then they just had their chips. Which, yeah, I was very weirded out. Like, why are you here? Why are there chips here? It, it's, it's a it's probably above and beyond what most of the people here at the conference could do with mm-hmm. anything. Those particular chips. I mean, yeah, we're talking about ISPs of like zero to thousand subs and they're not going to be doing any electrical engineering to figure out how to use those chips you know it's not a lot of stories out there yeah <laughs> well i definitely have ones that can stay solvent um well there's at least one <laughs> that can't um but um i don't recall which of the shows but i only go to operator focus shows and i do recall at previous shows of one kind or another you know component level vendors going there because I, I think what we're looking at is these manufacturers are going there to market to the operators so where can they meet a bunch of manufacturers at the show where they're trying to get to the operator yeah um, and since how effective have, i don't know but since, since wisp has no suitcasing policy they can't exactly just try to sign up and you know get with those vendors i guess they have to have a booth to, you know, be able to talk to vendors or something. I mean, it's, uh, okay. um, maybe that's an angle. You get a booth, and you just say, "Hey, those of you that might suitcase, get a get a, get an official presence in my booth." Yeah. And your, yeah, just your booth is the suitcaser's booth. Um, the question and, is, if, if at the show like this, you actually get to talk to people that. The, this decision power at those, you know, vendors and manufacturers that you actually need. I think a lot of the engineers do 
do come for certain companies like Cambium. Um, mm -hmm. Definitely has the engineers that, that show up and can you know, answer yeah. questions. And then Ciclu has some very technical support engineers that, that show up, you know, to answer questions and stuff and talk with other vendors. That actually happened right in front of me, which was kind of funny. But uh, <laughs> it's a, well, it's I, a, I know there was a lot of vendor to vendor conversations happening. Yeah. Uh, like the procurement guys were like, yeah, we're working on agreement. And that was one reason why that, that's what like they were saying was the reason they were there is to interface. So Did you feel like there was more vendors than, than uh, actual people, like operators at the show this time? Kind of seemed like it. it seemed like almost a 50 50 or more split, the, you know, vendors having more people. Yeah, it was a very, it, the showroom, the expo, expo floor was very thin. I think, yeah, you were mentioning that. Yeah, it's, um, not just me, the, even the other vendors that I talked to, everybody was saying that this show was, yeah, was, it just felt a little bit different than other shows in that if you had a booth and were actually exhibiting, there were very few what you would consider as customers coming and uh, yeah, actually that, talking to booths. And, that was also partly due to the sessions being down in some escalators into a fully, completely different spot of the convention center and then yeah, well, yeah, having crazy. cookies and, and stuff out there in those areas. And, and they so people, the first day they had cookies and coffee out, and then the next two days they had none. But yes. I was selling the cookies. Yeah, you did. They were good. They were good cookies. The food was good this year. The was, food was Pretty good. The he breakfast this morning was a little old. I, I mean, the eggs were not great, but everything else was pretty good. Yeah. I think it was a little bit of hit and miss. Some days it was good, the other days so they yeah. could have used improvement. Yeah. But, like, for me, for example, I'm, I'm used to literally having cues at the booths of, of people wanting to talk to you and you engage with people, and nothing like that happened this time. So, something was different. Hmm. So. It, it's, um, um, one of the vendors I talked to was saying that how often at the shows, um, and you know they were a larger, well, you know, well-known vendor. Um, that often they look at the shows as more customer relations than marketing. It's like you know, meeting the people that are you know, you know, solidifying those relationships. You know, putting you know faces to names, so on, relationship building, and less so on finding new customers. I'm sure that's different for different scale of customer, I mean, different scale of vendor. You know, if everybody already knows you, well, they already know you, and they're gonna buy your product if they want your product, if they're not, if, if they don't. But, you know, uh, you know, our booth was pretty lightly traveled. Um, and we can only, there's a, a small amount of people we could actually help too. So that's probably why we saw. So you're saying most of the people that you talked to were already customers of yours? Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's something else I was going to say earlier based on something you guys had said. And I <clears throat> well, I'm, let's see, uh, other notable things. Once again, uh, Mimosa is shocking the ISP world with, by making announcements about themselves or having announcements made about them during, <laughs> during the show without informing oh, anybody. I, I, I haven't heard about this. What's going on? Oh, well, just, just as an FYI, did you know that Mimosa had a really big customer in India? No. Oh, they have a really big customer in India. And that customer uh, decided that they wanted to buy it. From your skin. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Okay. $60 billion, I guess. No, for $60 million? Wait, no, yeah. Yes. That's a big difference. Yeah. You get the number of zeros. It, right it was millions. Um, actually, I thought it was 13. Uh, I, I think. We're not quoting any specific facts here. <laughs> oh, that's my wife for sure. Because that's the one that. You're, no, it was Jeremy. It was Jeremy Austin. Oh, oh. yeah. But yeah, he was just popping in here, so let's go. Let's we'll take a break, a battery break, and change out the battery since we only have two minutes left, anyways. Yeah. Uh, all right, so we were. I don't even remember what we were talking about. The cast has grown a little oh. bit. We got Jeremy here. 
Are we recording? Yes, yeah. we are. Oh, Welcome <laughs> to the Brothers List Podcast. <laughs> I think I'm putting my phone down. Hold on a second. That's fine. Um, yeah, we've got Jeremy, and then somebody else is supposed to be showing up until they show up. He's supposed to show up. Yeah, he's supposed to, but until then, he doesn't get named. It's not oh, a real we're person. Not gonna name we're not yeah. going to name Adair. We're not going to name Adair. Right. Adair shall go nameless. <laughs> I'm not even the one holding the drink. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm, the, I'm just when the one. When in Louisville. <laughs> drink the bourbon. It has been good. Um, well, they, don't, they don't think I've mentioned that that's the wrong way to pronounce it. Isn't it Louisville? Louisville. Louisville. Hey. I just was served you a just cocktail by, by a native, <laughs> a native of this city. And I would say it was very much like local. Yeah, local. It's um on the visitor center around the corner. They have the different possible. Yeah, I took a picture of them. <laughs> it, yeah, Louisville, Louisville. So, what do you find that was interesting this year, Jeremy? Can I go last? Well, you are last. Well, yes, yeah. 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 no, no, we already went. Uh, 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 for you know, in Louisville or for the show, either or. I found it interesting that there were so many new vendors here. It was packed. Like as a vendor now, you know, I've kind of gone over to the dark side uh, from being an operator to being really a full-time vendor. I must say that it was really gratifying to see completely unfamiliar faces. And I say that with the understanding that what I love about coming to Wisp America is seeing the familiar faces. So this was actually... You know, I, I got I got to see the familiar faces, which is wonderful. You know, Justin, I think probably saw you first easily seven or eight years ago. Probably. At, it, if it wasn't Louisville, it was one of the shows around them, you know, when we, this is our second time here. So uh, it was it was great to see that. I would say the downside maybe that maybe we had fewer new operators. So maybe this is a sign of like confidence, you know, vendor confidence in the industry. I'm not really sure what it means for the industry itself in terms of like the operators and the you know the actual the actual revenue. But yeah. That's a very vendor centric uh perspective. There were a lot of wisps that were small to the show. You I think, think so? Historically the Wisp of America show is usually a lot of smaller you think operators, so? um, or people that are just trying to start that you know come to a cheaper show. Because Vegas the Vegas show is a little bit more expensive to get to. I will um, say so that it's definitely much bigger. Yeah. And there are larger operators in this show, uh, at the um, Wisp of yeah. show. Yeah. I probably said before that what I value, one of the things I really like about Wisp of America is that because it is a smaller show, you can really have a lot more quality time with the people that you have, just simply by virtue of the fact that there are fewer of them. And the conversations that I had were mostly with actually larger providers. I had a few conversations with smaller guys, but you know, I definitely met at least two or three people who were really just starting out, you know, they haven't dried up, the people who are still doing that. Uh, and I look forward to, to how everybody does, whether they're small or large. And uh, it was, the conversations that I had were, were really good. You were saying that uh, the feeling is better here because it's more personal. And uh, when you're at Vegas, there's a bunch of other people that are unrelated to the Wispa show that are there in the casinos or there around. Oh, 100%. And you can't spot the other operators, but here, you could definitely spot the other operators. The, oh, the hotel bars so are popping every night. There was that, that sports bar that we went to uh, yesterday evening. It was packed with just operators and vendors. You knew that everyone there was for that specific purpose. Right. You don't get that in Vegas. Yeah. It's very diluted in Vegas. You yeah. know, so. And you got all the constant noise and lights of the casinos. And it's just, it is, I mean, some people are there for that fun. I'm not, personally. I'm there to, to be with people. No, in Vegas you don't get like a this uh, organized research event for like the yeah. the Sunday, right? Yeah, so that's I think there could be. I mean, there could be, but there. isn't. Yeah, I I mean, for that number of people, like this shows a lot smaller. I think what was it like twelve hundred people? I heard sixteen. Sixteen is what? If we had sixteen, that is a significant increase over the previous record, which is about twelve. Yeah. So then I would say that the fact that it felt small is a function of just the vibe and not the not the actual the wisp of numbers. Yeah. It didn't feel like it to me. Yeah, I mean, sixteen with counting vendors because yeah. Oh yeah, right. It I like, yeah, Wisp never or... never releases the split. Yeah. You have to like look through the list. So we were saying it felt like there were more vendors than operators. Yes. Yeah. And more like more vendor employees came along than normal. That's possible too because it is a little easier to get to, you know, I had really good 
vendor to vendor interactions and met a lot of really cool people. Some of them also run Lisps. So, you know, there's a gray area there. Yeah, definitely a little bit on that side. So, um, oh, and, and we were talking about um, the most of it getting bought by uh, one of their customers. Wouldn't it be cool to like be able to buy one of your vendors because you're just like. That didn't work so well for who's those folks in. In the Midwest. Was it Starry? Starry, yeah. We were just yeah. actually made two of them. Yeah. And yeah. like my most sell stock price has been going quite badly. Close to delisting, yeah. Yeah, very close to delisting at this point, so that's a, probably a indication of why that deal happened as well. Yeah. I was a little surprised that they had such a large booth. They had this, you know, uh, a big booth. <laughs> well, they had just the same. <laughs> yeah. Well, they had <laughs> guys. They just saw one, four, or five guys. But yeah, they just, I mean, this morning they just saw. I think so they were literally not here for the last day of the show? They were on the floor, but they were elsewhere because there was no one going over to talk to them other than people to say, oh, what does it mean that you got bought? That could be a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they uh, they well, came in hot and heavy, and they changed a lot of stuff. They had a lot more tech, and then boom. It, it, it just all dried up. Like it this. is hard come, trying to come in as a third, you know, to counter Toronto is having some some really good success there, but that's unusual to have that much penetration so quickly. Oh, the thing with Toronto is they have a lot of money, and that's investment money. Right. Question is what happens when all of that investment money runs out. Right. Which is very similar to what happened to so Apparently, you have to have a lot of invested money to get their hardware tunes. At first, it was really expensive. It is expensive. Yeah. With uh, subscription on top, like the CDs yeah. are very expensive. It does things yeah, nobody else can so do. But what's is. the return on your investment when you buy a CD that, that is that expensive? You're looking at like a year. And you're still paying the subscription, which yeah. is taking out of your ROI. Yeah. So, which so. I believe in cases is more than most of the other recurring subscription costs, for example, CMS, monitoring, uh, you know, firmware updates if you're running something. Or you know, management if you're running something like Master X. It's a it's a good chunk. Yeah. Now you don't aren't don't actually need to have the subscription. You can do up to fifty megabits per second for the CPS yeah. you know, on license. But to me, it seems like the, the appeal of this is to be able to do these premium plans. Correct. In places yeah. that where nobody else can do a premium plan. Those are the plans you want to be doing. Right? Well, that's that's one argument. But the other argument for Toronto is that you can deliver all the time. Like high density, density. Yeah. yeah, high density, end loss, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We'll like see those, and so you. Yeah, and yeah are there any That's other? the selling point of this. Yeah, I and mean, I don't run them. I, yeah, we, we put out statistics on them. Yeah. You know, they they're definitely absolutely having some good success in the delivery department. Yeah, longevity and cost effectiveness and ROI those still remain to be seen. Yeah, I I, I will be really curious to see, and then. I know you guys just had your first report that in included, November, yeah, yeah, that included Toronto results. And you know, the same. I remember the same argument being leveled against Cambium back when Rise was snapping up Cambium operators. Mm -hmm. They were saying, "Well, you never make any money versus you know, say ubiquity equipment." And I think the time has proven that that's not true. You know, you really can be. In fact, I think some of the most effective. It saves you the truck rolls and the headaches and the, and the RF issues. You gotta look at the total cost. The whole yeah. package, you can make money if something is more expensive. It just depends on how many times you have to touch that customer. Yeah. If you're if you're actually set it, forget it, and don't ever have to touch it again, it's a huge cost reduction. Like for me, we were a ubiquity shop. The cost of the CP was a minuscule for compared to all the other costs. It's right. more to roll a truck than hardware. Correct. Yeah. Yep. Multiple times more. So, yeah, I, which is one reason why I was really, really strange in, at my last place about what insults we were doing to me. It's like, I'm not going to go, I don't want to go back. If I can stop going back, we are going to save ourselves a lot of money. And any phone calls that we get from customers are, you know, that costs you money too. So, you know, that's why you're in having. You know everything that you can to keep the customer from calling you is really useful, including delisting your phone number. And <laughs> <laughs> it's a, um, but um, you know, you're back to uh, Toronto's, and I don't pretend to turn this podcast into something a Toronto focus one because there's 
they didn't do anything new. There are some other Avengers that they thought they talked about. Oh yeah. But um um I remain skeptical because the last time we had a new vendor on the scene that was, you know, look at all these amazing things that we can do that no one else can do and our product will work everywhere really, really fast. And they had supporting case studies and operators that could back it up. Well, a couple of years later, when it had really spread, it was determined that it wasn't it wasn't as good as they were saying. Um, you know, time will tell. All right. So it's a uh, well, time will tell if Toronto ends up being the person that delivers what they say they can deliver, and it continues to be successful four years later. Or it's just, well, we just trimmed, you know, their claims are, are possible under particular situations, and other vendors can cheapen them in more situations, but you probably won't. Yeah. So, well, and, and so frequently you're going to be seeing, um, you know, other companies replicate those features, especially as the time goes on. Or if it's commodity RF, you know, then this, it becomes the, the packaging and the management. Mm -hmm. so. I've also thought it was interesting to see not just, you know, obviously Toronto is back and, and you know, from the looks of it doing well, Samsung came to this show, yeah, I believe for the first time ever. So, and they're pushing a 5G product. I did not have any time to look at the product, but mm -hmm. I find that really interesting to see, you know, now Ericsson's got some competition on the 5G side, right? It's a, it's a, my, like, I was wondering why they hadn't been here earlier because we've had Nokia and Ericsson. Right. It's like, well, where's... Where's the last major, oh, right. um, you know, well, last major non-Chinese, right? You know, base station manufacturer, and now they are. Yeah. Um, I think know. I saw several new. I mean, maybe maybe they were new to me, but uh, we're definitely seeing some growth in managed home Wi-Fi, so managed routers. Yeah, there was a zillion different. I saw at least two that were new to me. Um, of course, I, you know, those are the people I want to have conversations with because we're in kind of the same, you know, compatible space. We don't compete directly, but we have the same goal of giving the operator end to end visibility. Which ones are you referring to? Uh, well, I'm thinking specifically of um, one that starts with net. Um, they're on the back wall. I'm sorry. Oh, um, it's go? No. Um, uh, it's not net elastic because that's the BNG folks. A10 yeah. was here, so on the, the BNG side, but. Mercury is one that is here yeah. from, uh, from Canada, and there's another one as well. Uh, Velo was here, but the Velo yeah. has been here before. Yeah, Velo has been right. They were at Wisp before. Was that, I want to say they were at Wisp America last year. I think so. Yeah. Uh, I want to say they had at least 20 employees here. They, because every time I, would, I did the speed dating, I there was four. always one that yeah. was at the table was at. Oh, okay. Every yeah. single time. Yeah, I know they had at least four. four. Yeah. So, and they there's more, more fiber vendors too, yeah. right? No, yeah, everyone. Like, if, uh, and all the Disney's had some sort of fiber equipment. Right. So then, for the managed home router study, that's really interesting. That segment seems like it's currently... So I talked to a lot of people who were complaining that limit is gone now, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yes. so like that segment seems like it's in a high churn, still trying to figure it out... It is a very fragmented market. Yeah, yeah very fragmented. Lot of people. I think they were. They had. Yeah. 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 So, so it's it's interesting how and where that market will be going. What happens to it, and how much more churn will there be before it like settles a bit? And because even, and from remote inboxes, they even they're kind of trying to position themselves as a alternative to Unimus in some cases. Yeah. Right? Which I don't. Yeah. <laughs> we don't really consider them like an alternative or a right. Well, I'm just saying, like it's interesting to see. That they are wanting to. I feel they still haven't really figured out who they are and what yeah. they do, but that's yeah. just my opinion. But uh, yeah, they did say that they offer a backup solution for Microtech, but for everything else, Green yeah. Scott has that covered. So we were. Yeah, I think that that. So to me, and I've said this many times before, to me, any solution that like does on-device active like scripts and running all of the on-device stuff is not really unless that device is custom built for it. Right. right. Like, like Minim, yeah, for example. But I don't know if that's a 
good way to, to build a product. Well, you cannot build a product that covers multiple when there isn't you know, much stuff that way. So I think, yeah, that, that's why I'm saying they're still trying to figure out who they are. And they probably see a good hole in the market right now with this managed whole routers. And I think there they can probably do good stuff. Oh, very absolutely. Uh, yes, yeah. definitely. You know, if you're already running yeah. microtech routers on the home, like it makes so much sense. You need to be automating it. You need to be managing it centrally. The question is then you are tying your entire business to a single That's vendor. Single vendor yeah. And if that vendor brings something that's native to them, that does it better, it's you know, it's well that's what happened in a minute where they had yeah, Microsoft exactly. specific features and then there were things you could only do in Motorola and then you end up having this this fork in the product, which is very painful. And not just that, but and full disclosure, yeah, Unimus is kind of as I said, we don't consider remote inbox uh, Right, yeah, right. Remote you don't inbox, consider it. Uh, a competitor or a you know, competing solution. But we've seen these solutions before, actually quite a few of them, which do exactly what remote inbox does. And like how many of them still exist today? Not yeah. many. So yeah. it's, uh, th that's why I'm, I still think the market hasn't settled. It has not settled. And you will see a lot of churn, a lot of companies coming <laughs> right. and going as the investment yeah. money that they had runs out. Uh, and, it's, it's interesting yeah. to see, we, you know, to, to talk about competition there, I'm happy to talk about that in our field where we've been predicting for years that shaping itself will become commoditized, right? So we have a number of competitors coming to the show. We have Paracom showed up. But I should say, I don't consider them competitors. They consider themselves competitors. Yeah. Um, Lever QoS, I don't know if they actually had any booth or anything, but there's certainly lots of discussion from, uh, you know, from Robert Chacon. Yes, I say uh, well, I was, I was going to use that as a sort of cautionary tale. Like, um, you know, Procera and Saise have done very poorly in this space. So you think about Chorin, whereas you know, Prisim has done very well. And Cambium for the last year has been heavily pushing their product, right? We don't see them actually as competitors because all the other things that we are doing that we think are actually more important. And and from a from a uh, shaping perspective, we're all going to be very similar in terms of the result. That's a commodity. That's commoditized. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I think it's interesting that there's more choice now, but I also think it's it's not going to last, right? The market doesn't sustain. Yeah, this is five vendors. It, this it is doesn't not sustain a five vendors doing things like that. It's just a, it's not a big market. Yeah. So, you know, we'll see what um, those guys. Uh, let's see, I'm trying to think of that last company's name, but um, what about other new vendors that you saw, uh, like? We were mentioning the 60 gigahertz guys for Ubiquity. They're here. Still can't remember their name. I tried to remember it. Perso or something, something. Yeah, something, whatever. I, I uh, did not get a chance. Fiber vendors are all over the place. Actually, I thought what was really hilarious um, the like premier sponsor, Calix, yes. had like one of the smallest booths. Right. That had like three employees in it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, they had more than that. They had, they had <coughs> really? I spent a bunch of time over there and I talked to them about particularly our business model and the MDU business model and how it's been a, a dork segment of their 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 processes and uh, the way they, they look at things. Um, and uh, Steve basically said that you're going to try to start an MDU advisory council to try to solve some of these problems. I think their, their biggest competitor is Bloom. And Bloom right. came out of an MDU kind of solution, so now there's big talks about what they're going to do to answer that question. What's Calix doing for MDUs? Yeah. There hasn't been a hell of a lot in recent years. So It's interesting that you bring up Bloom, because I was in a session where we were talking about, you know, you know kind of add-on services. How can you raise your average revenue per user, your ARPU? And one of the suggestions, of course, was, you know, manage router services. Rather, many, many ISPs choose to just require everything to be managed and raise the prices to cover it. Mm -hmm. um, Plume is kind of a different model in many ISPs where, you know, they maybe you get the base unit for free, but if you want to do mesh, then you're paying a, a, a subscription fee. And uh, Nathan, uh, Nathan from Whisper, pointed out that he read the fine print and decided not to go with Plume because he really wouldn't own the customer in that case. And so when we see these other, uh, you know, this proliferation of vendors in this space, there's just still a lot of different ways to own that product and to manage that. And I, you're right, it hasn't settled out either. But, uh, you know, Plume hasn't shown up yet. <laughs> Just looking at Plume, yeah. well, Plume was at the Dish Conference. So I yeah. got a big, big talk with them. As a personal it. user, I love Plume. 
But as an ISP. I, I, well, when talking with Plume, I didn't get a whole lot of substance. It was a lot of marketing. And, and it was a lot of, like, marketing that didn't make a lot of sense to me. like For your MDU. For MDUs yeah. or anything. And it was just a bunch of claims that seemed um, not possible as well from the sales guy. Really? Um, like, what kind of? Like, oh, he was saying that uh, when the new iPhone comes out, they have experience with it because they have deployments across the entire you you know world and so in australia when the new I, ios 15 comes out and it's on their wi-fi they can look at with their ai and detect issues with it and, and, and fix those before you know uh you know a couple of releases so all the phones across the world work fine and stuff it's just like that's kind of cool but i don't really know where ai why you brought ai into this conversation and it, because it's a buzzword. Yeah, it's, it's a buzzword. buzzword. It's a lot of buzzwords and just talk and just like features that you're just like talking about. Buzzwords. This is a pretty That's anti-buzzwordy just, market. Or yeah, buzzword it's bringing up buzzwords to me. Yeah. I'm just like, yeah, whatever. Yeah. As soon as buzzwords hit, everyone starts to There's definitely attraction to new and giant. But, yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. we brought new stuff out. We know actually what I thought was interesting is that, and I'm not going to talk about it, I'm just saying that that was, in a sense, the, the least important thing that we could talk about at the show. Right. Yeah. I think in this market, what you consider, you know, new and shiny and exciting is not the buzzword. It's the raw technology, and you have to be able to talk about the raw technology in technical terms right. rather than using marketing. Correct. Terms. Yeah. And, and, and that's where you see successful companies continue to do well. The ones who keep coming figure that out. Yeah. Is that they bring engineers to talk to people right. who, you know, I, I'm I'm ne- not an engineer. I'm never going to be. But I you can certainly sense. talk technical. Yeah, I can talk technical, and I know when somebody is talking back to me technically, and when they're just giving me spew. That you're smart enough to know when someone's talking technical to you, and, you're, and they're also wrong. On the podcast, <laughs> yeah, which is a thing too. So yeah, so you know, don't need a philosophy degree to do that. And there's plenty of guys here who are far smarter than me, who are interacting and doing stuff. Decisions. That's one of the things I love about coming to any Whisper show is just being able to spend time with my customers, many of whom are super, super smart people. I always learn from everything. And that's, that's way more valuable to me to be able to what I get out of it than what I can provide. Yeah. yeah. I was able to participate in some sessions and I think I was helpful, but uh, I, I think the total, the community is benefiting so much from everybody getting together and just sharing information freely like we do in our sessions. Yeah. What did you think of the new format? With the ending day, um, I thought I, it was really interesting with um, like just how much of interaction and in, in like dance, like the uh, well, like closing the, ceremonies for those who weren't here. Yeah, closing so, ceremonies were in the exhibit hall. Yeah, and then there were still a couple more sessions. Yeah, yeah more sessions, and yes. there was more uh, speed dating. Like, and there was more speed. A lot of that. Oh heck! I gotta talk about Luna Whisper. Yeah. Do, so did any of you come? You came, right, Justin? Okay. Any none of you came? I I was I I planned on it. I put it on my calendar, and then okay. I had people skip. So Women of Whispa is like an activity of of uh, that's you know, supported by Whispa or kind of under Whispa. It's currently being sponsored by I think Calix helped sponsor it this year. Sonar and Cuisine have sponsored it. This is our third uh, show that's had a Women of Whispa event. And they're gradually, uh, you know, having more organized, uh, you know, interaction in the community. So, like the very first, uh, we did a breakfast a year ago, and I was like, you know, as the sponsor, it was like the only guy to show up, right? And then in Vegas, we got some more people to show up because the the uh, the the fact is, it's not just for women; it's for people who want to raise the visibility and awareness of, you know, inspire other women that there are opportunities in this industry for them. I mean, there are women operators, there are women engineers; they're not very visible. It's a shame. And uh, th- today, I would say, if I think it was like two-fifths men. It was fantastic. We did, and we mostly did a round table, uh, you know, kind of talking about, uh, you know, how can, how can we encourage women in the industry? And if you employ women, like in my case, or if you are a woman working in the industry, like how did you get into tech? You know, it was a really fantastic time. Uh, I'm glad so many people came out. It was, it's definitely been it's the best one yet. So if we can keep with that momentum in Vegas, um, we're going to continue to have a really fun time. I think there will be more activities as well. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how it, it's not like a committee yet or under WISPA, but it'll, pro- it'll have some sort of formal structure so that, um, uh, you know, it can be self-sustaining and ongoing because, you know, there's going to be turnover in the board and 
um, there's they they uh, did a uh, take names for like subcommittees of women of WISPA, and there was a really fantastic response of people who really want to be involved, um, and because so many of the activities that WISPA do are not just what the paid folks are doing and the board activities and the policy, there really is a lot of volunteer activity that goes on. Um, it's important that people be aware that A, there's a need, B, there's an opportunity, and C, that it could be them, it could be you. Like, that is what makes this community work, not just the fact that we have a David Zumwalt, who's fantastic, but, or, and the board, who we elect every few years. It's that it really is an entire community pulling together, and that community can also include, you know, more women. Yeah. So, um, I, I thought that the language for, uh, I, I thought it was going to click. Probably <coughs> just soon. I yeah. said time for 16 minutes after I had time to set one, so. And it's at 26. I blame you Europeans for this. <laughs> Why? What did we do? Oh yeah, um, this is your, your rules, making life miserable for the rest of us. It's because it's the EU <coughs> treat a camcorder Versus different than a video camera. So right. if, of course, you want to you mean, a, you time, mean a, a, like a camera, a digital camera well, from a camcorder. Well, right. it's it, it, it just how long it can record differentiates it. From differentiates it between different products and there's different taxations and regulations and so on and so on and so on. It's all your fault. So what they do is they make the hardware can, can do oh. ours, but it's a software. Oh, it's a software. Well, I think they just have a big software for the EU. Well, that would require them to not to, to, to not be late. It's not open source. All right, it's, 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 it's kind of no, small, not European small. You know, third party hacks. Well, yeah, but it's Europe. Europe's also brought us all those damn cookie warnings, and now I have all the. Uh, I am, but, but you I am, see on the iPhone. I am proud. So I never on this day. It's not going to benefit me. It'll it'll be there eventually. Yeah. Actually, you should look at it. It's the next time I'm upgrading. Is when the USB C. I don't feel strongly about it, but I certainly will not complain about having a USB C iPhone. I very rarely plug it in to char other than to charge it. So to me, the it's the last device I have that has lightning to it. So right, just like ready to get on. Right, my iPad is USB C. My laptop's doing it. It's um no, it's a, it's also not just Canon. Like every Canon, Nikon, Sony, so on. Like they all do. You burn the whole market, man. Okay. God. Sorry. Okay. All right. I'll, I'll go to my <laughs> senior officials and government representatives. Of yes. Life. Write a letter. <laughs> a strongly worded letter. <laughs> strongly worded email. Yes. yes. All right. So, uh, women of Wispa. Um, I, 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 I saw a lot of women here too. Like there was noticeably a higher percentage of women um, here. So I, I really feel like that's actually been. And, I, and in the speed dating, it was evident that it wasn't all just vendors, right? There really were quite a few operators. I talked to many. And that's that's really good that, that operators are sending. I mean, spoke to several, like, you know, mom and pop shops where it's the mom who's here, right? Mm -hmm. And she's here for just as, just the same same technical reasons or business reasons that the pop would have been here for. So, yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah, so um, really cool and progression. And you know, benefit of the industry. So, uh, what do you think about how David approached the fact that we have Wispa, that is wireless internet service providers, yeah. and of the like, like trying to try to rebrand a little bit, right? Yeah, the the big thing. Honestly, <coughs> the premier number one sponsor was Cali. Every single like of, of all the distributors on the sponsor list, they all sell some sort of fiber equipment. Um, we serve fiber. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, you, and supporting of fiber and you know, it's everywhere in the industry. It's a new tool yeah. that um, I, I, I spoke to a couple company. operators who weren't planning to deploy fiber, but they were few. And I spoke to lots of operators who had done a ton of fiber and were doing some wireless. You know? So what do you think about Wispa's like the rebrand? Yeah, yeah, the domestic It is a hard thing. thing to do, you know, because you don't want to lose your you know, your, your market share mind space of the acronym that you have. And, but at the same time, you have to come up with, I think they have a slogan of some kind, which is sort of signaling that it's, you know, for all. It's like, well, Women of Wispa, it's not just for women. <laughs> wireless ISPs, it's not just wireless. I, I, wonderful. It's the wonderful internet. It's the wonderful. Association. <laughs> no, no rebranding. 
Yeah. Is there a, is there a way? Gaslight you all the time. This has always been wonderful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is there well, a word for W? It starts with W that stands for not eligible for beef funding. <laughs> <laughs> Wasted. Sorry, that was dark. Yeah, yeah. Wasted. It was dark. <laughs> no, it was dark. Um, I, mean, I, I, I think they've done a pretty decent job because I mean, you, you do have these two, you know, counter polarizing uh, pushes. Like, there's the fiber people who are like, fiber should be everything, and like you mean the fiber organizations, the trade organizations, yeah. which are pushing that. Absolutely, yeah, we yeah. go to those shows, and you know, they're they're not winning that battle, but they're trying to fight it. Broadband communities is a lot like that. It's fiber, 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 fiber. And uh, they, they want fiber to the apartment. And, you know, you can do a lot of the same services with Ethernet to the apartment. Right. Or coax to the apartment. But if you bring so, it up, they're like, well, fiber, 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 fiber. They just ignore you. They just drown you out with all the fiber, fiber, fiber that they talk. So. Yeah. Merku had a, speaking of fiber to the apartment, Merku had a solution. I think it's going to be an EU thing. Only, I, didn't, I don't know if it's going to come to the stage, but they were showing it. But it's basically an in wall plug in power and fiber. Mm -hmm. So then you just plug in your wall, uh, you know, CPE or your, your AP or your mesh or whatever it is, and the termination is there in a socket in a jack. So it's not like somewhere in a NID hidden away or whatever. It's like the consumer can actually have some choice there. I thought that was mm -hmm. kind of interesting. That's kind of cool. I, I don't know how like clean and safe it's going to be. You know, like how do you make that connector? be kind of user serviceable. Yeah, because yeah, you're gonna get that in the end. Did did any of you see Jens's um, presentation on Leo? I saw that it looked interesting because he was talking about um, like the threats uh, to uh yeah. wireless internet and what was your takeaway from, from uh program? so I, I didn't get to see all of it. I only okay. saw like a middle portion because I got pulled away before and after for phone calls. I think latency is the killer feature for internet. So if you have higher latency, you may not do as well. But that's my take on it. So. His uh, his you know kind of introduction to satellite and and uh, and then low Earth orbit as well. I thought it was really well done. Um, it, you know, I he came he basically came to the same conclusions that I did a couple years ago when I wrote a blog post on this, which is I look at the total amount of spectrum and the modulations that they're going to run at, how much they're going to have per per area. And came to the conclusion that it's going to be fantastic for people in low populated areas. My parents now finally have broadband after many, many years of never. And because of Darwin, they, they have since, you know, since November, we have it. And um, it's not going to take every customer from West. It's not possible. There's not enough spectrum there. Even Kuiper, which will be the next, you know, Amazon's one, which will have, it's, you know, the, looking at the specs, it's going to have a lot more bandwidth than Starlink. It is also not going to put Wisps out of business. The question is if Kuiper ever even happens. But even <laughs> uh, yeah. the point is, plan for the quote worst case and say, yes, let's assume that it that gets implemented as designed. Um, it, you know, am I still going to have a business? And I would say in the vast majority of cases, this is absolutely true. He's an RF engineer, um, and uh, he, he was really giving, as far as I could tell, very factually accurate assessments. I mean, I'm I'm a lay RF engineer. He would I would say it's a professional RF engineer. And yet he was able to to produce these results in a. I think it's as simple, simple as with any other competition. If you deliver a good enough service and a good enough experience, you are not really in danger. Right. right. The choice of technology isn't actually the the threat there. Yeah, I, I I would say it's definitely going to be more detrimental for the WISPs that are still selling at max. 10, 20 Absolutely, minutes. people want the 150 minute speed test. They want the 200 minute speed test. Absolutely, but they but it's it's within the right reach. Another thing that Wisps are never going to be beat on in this case is the the local support. Like right now, if you are a Starlink user and you want support, you are not having a good experience. Mm -hmm. It's you know message and email only, and very rare cases maybe they'll call you. You know they're doing it at a very large scale and they're choosing to do it you know like as computerized and automated as possible. Like Which means there's no Tesla and you can't even contact anyone <coughs> about your issues. You know? I, I think honestly for Starling it's kind of smart actually because Oh right. I'm honestly, not disagreeing with their, their choice to do that. No. I'm saying is it also is a good thing for, for WISPs. Well honestly, probably all of us know that most of the issues aren't actually 
I have species. Yes, we, we say that. Yeah. And like, imagine if Starlink selling to, you know, complete not technical people were to actually implement some serious support. Like, they would be overwhelmed and killed with issues which are not really Starlink issues. So it's like at a certain point I understand and it's the right and the smart choice. Like if most of the issues are gonna be in the home network anyway, then just let the user find whoever wants to deal with the local home network issues, right? Which kinda of makes sense. And they made it pretty straightforward with the app for you to be able to tell whether it's Yeah, exactly. In the app you see whether it's a problem with your Every, network. Everybody or should not. do that as well. If you're a wizard, you should be producing or using you know, partnering with somebody who can get you an app that it is that first line of of defense, but then I think you could probably also be Starlink on, on support. Oh yeah, you could. Yeah. I'm not saying you can't. I'm saying like probably for Starlink is the right choice. Sorry? The bar is low. The yeah. bar is low. <laughs> but also the thing is, it will it won't be that onerous for you if you also do what Starlink is doing, right? You yeah. know, and make it as easy as possible. The app's not perfect, but I will say from a, you know, like go go plug it in and, and make it work. It's pretty seamless. Yeah. Well, like these days. Pretty much everybody has like second hand connectivity, like from their phone, right? So it's not the dark. It's the people who don't have secondary connectivity are having the most trouble. Well, even then, like it's not the dark days anymore where the end user only had a single internet connection point. And if that went down, they were screwed. Right? Some of these rural areas are yeah, they really are. Sure, I'm not saying for everybody. <laughs> On the ocean, that's going to be true. You know, yeah. Outside of the sure, outside of the inland waters, no, it's the ma be, majority true. of your use cases is that. Your primary internet goes down. You still have some Giant. kind of yeah, similar messages to the world. So yeah, if you have the dashboards, if you have the customer portals, if you can show the customer via the apps, whatever is the preferred way to do that or whatever way you choose, yeah, it adds a lot to the customer experience. Like if I can just check if it's me or them, right. or if there is a planned outage, right? It's and if the customers are going to get used to this kind of approach from starting anyway, because they aren't getting any kind of approach. Right, then uh, it's a question of, yeah, can you do that as well? Where the industry is going, how to handle the end customers, what service do you offer, do you do managed stuff, etc. etc. So, I, I don't think there is a right answer, but I certainly don't think that Starlink is a like a basic killer, not at all. No, yeah, by and large, and that was the conclusion of that presentation. Yeah, that it wasn't any close, but no, it, no. it's a it's a it's killer. already a huge swath of the United States is at the yeah. Mm -hmm. They are not taking orders and they're charging the people more mm -hmm. if it's in a busy area. Well, so they're both charging people more and charging people less. They actually will drop you 10 They, bucks they dropped the 20, 20 bucks off for my parents. Yeah. So I think that's like in, you know, that's how you incentivize. Base. Maybe, we, well, we were talking about this today in terms of consumption. It's just a usage based billing, maybe just demand based billing. Balance out your network that way. Well, that's it's that not, not, isn't the same with the uh, mobile operators are doing something similar in that when they've started to add their fixed wireless products, if it's you know, if the network is at capacity in the area, it's not available. Right. So th this is the shades of gray where you're trying to steer it. Like clearly, they're trying to deliberately drop customers. In places where it's congested by raising the prices, and because they're charging up front for the CPE, it doesn't hurt their um, their their time to recovery. Yeah. Okay. Now they're probably still selling at a loss, but I'm sure they've run the numbers on there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but that's less of a loss. Than it is a really interesting. Like, hey, you know, if I have a bunch of customers here, I'm have it's more expensive for me to upgrade this backhaul than it's worth. As far as when you put your your your, your um, location into the into yeah. the what plans are available for me, you get a very granular. Yeah, and you can go okay. Well, I, I'll sell you you know hundred megs for two hundred bucks a month. The, I think the chat the overhead the challenge of like managing a whole bunch of plans because otherwise, like from a capacity planning perspective, it could be like, well, there's twenty people on the AP and the AP really should have fifteen. I want to raise all of the prices by a certain amount, and we'll see how many drop off. Right. Um, well, you were saying that it might not be financially feasible to upgrade them, but if you do increase those prices, it might suddenly become financially feasible to, to upgrade those. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, so it could be a win-win. And the people who move off, they go to something that theoretically meets their needs. Yeah, or not, and then they come back. Yeah. And right. then they pay the higher price and an install price. 
<laughs> it is. I think, you know, with the end goal of, of really optimizing how much revenue it's generating and how much service people are getting, like, it, I think it's an exercise that does need to be run. Even if you decide, like, I was hearing from Adair today where um, when people were starting to work from home during COVID, they just increased all the upload fees. Just, like, out of the goodness of their heart. But I think it's also good business practice, too. Their customers are happier. Yeah. So you got to weigh those things out. It's not, there's no one answer of, you know, I suppose if you're big enough, you can kind of play around with, you know, little minor gradations of pricing, but that... Oh, the problem, or, well, not the problem, but really, like, the challenge, I suppose, is that most of risks are started by technical people and by business people, yeah. and also once it, then it's the scale that you get that you can actually hire or contract somebody who has all that business knowledge, can do all the analytics to figure this out, learn your network to a point where they understand where this comes into play. Like, there's a lot of moving parts to, yeah. to implement things. Okay, so we're gonna, we need a new vendor at, in Vegas who will be doing price optimization as a service. <laughs> <laughs> so there is another new vendor here. I think they're very into agility. Agility, yes. Agility. Telco Systems and yeah. Agility is a product from Telco Systems. Faisal's been talking to me about it for a while, and I really wasn't sure what they were about, and then I talked to, to uh, one yeah, of the other guys. Yeah, he came to me super excited and yes. wanted to talk to me about it, and, and uh, so I went over and talked with them. It, it seems like it's a uh, easy solution to deploy virtual machines on white box hardware yes. that you might stick at your edge locations or, or make routers for locations or your towers that have you know software stacks on them. So if you want to sell like some virtual network functions to some enterprise, it makes it easy for, they, like these are companies that don't really have networking engineering capabilities. You can essentially deploy these much faster by using their agility automation platform. And that, that did make some sense. I'm not certain that that is the core market for WISPs, <coughs> but it does, there is a, there isn't an enterprise, or maybe it's called like sub-enterprise SMB market that um, can benefit from that. There, you know, AT and T's been doing that for a long time. There's, you know, lots of people doing virtualized so functions. They supported like Microtech and CHR and uh, what were some other things they support? Like Ubuntu Desktop and other, you know, Flex they like to do to do, you know, and, uh, us. and really quick, just yeah, so they're hard. Like this, this is basically kind of a. <laughs> uh, it's a hypervisor. Yeah, it's, it's a, a hypervisor. hypervisor. Yeah, but specifically, like you buy these packages and. We can configure them to work together. It's a hypervisor built on top of OpenStack, and you're using OpenStack images and cloud ant to con configure things. Yep. Mm -hmm. So I was like, well, it's great. You know, you get this Microtech installed or this other product installed. You have to go into that and then configure it. They were they were saying, well, you can do all that configuration with cloud ant. I was like, well, how does that differ from me doing it with Proxmox and Ansible or Sh Chef or some other? Is that most people don't have you to run and, that? It, yes, and they were like, "Well, this is super easy." I'm like, "Well, it still sounds like we have to go into a YAML file and file it to, you know, configure all this stuff." So you're still gonna have to have some level of expertise to use this stuff, else you're just gonna have VMs. Oh, absolutely. But I think the, the idea is to shift that expertise into the MSP, into the managed service provider, so that. No, it's gonna be that simple. Like, well, yeah. that's their pitch. I think. Yeah. I, I don't want to. Misrepresent what they're saying. I told Faisal like I didn't really understand it when you explained it to me, but then we actually drew a picture. You know the the, the telco systems person I spoke to. So I know I don't have a complete understanding of it yet. The so big telcos and big providers have been pushing edge compute and yeah, yeah no, the compute nodes directly next to a customer for a big time. <laughs> that this market, gives you flexibility to, to well it, implement the yeah, services. What are the edge compute? Well, DNS. So yeah, um, that, that market is filtering any uh, yeah. virtual network function. That well, market hasn't really like materialized, ma materialized fully yet. So it's a lot of the talk you get for this edge compute marketing and business cases are cases which are but in the future when you have streaming VR, when you have this, this, <laughs> and this, future. this edge compute will be super uh, important it's because low latency to the customer is that, but like it's, realistically, it's not great for gaming. Or anything like that. Yeah. So what, what's the killer market for this? Exactly. I mean, one so of the things I thought of was like DVRs or network video surveillance and stuff like that could be, you know, hosted closer to customers. So you don't have to backhaul that video all the way back to the cloud to aggregate it. You know. So. But yeah, mm -hmm. like that's a huge market share that is going to completely <laughs> up in. Well, yeah. in my my particular market where there's MVUs, there's mm -hmm. an NVR system or access control system at all of the locations. So right. you think well, about okay. it from that perspective, yeah. 
it makes a lot of sense for me that I can post you gotta like unified for text. Who all the end users are. Yeah. And the end users are not all just the the renter of the apartment. Yeah. It's also the landlord. The landlord. Yeah. It's the third party security company that is managing this. It's the managed service provider that's managing that. The the question is is there really benefit of having this in the edge compute cloud versus on premise? Yeah, is the market CEO? Yeah, yeah. That is the, it's available. Yeah. It's another market which is not really settled. There is a lot of buzzwords being thrown around, but like really, there is no killer edge and no killer problem that it solves. It, uh, and, it's, 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 and it's and it's building your buzzwords business on the success of other buzzwords, right? Um, you know, I've seen this uh, for a long time. In the you know because you, know, you know running an IX you just pay to a lots of different data center operators and for a few years now it's been edge 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 and then like you have somebody who's saying you know edge at the tower and I'm like clearly no one no one who is proposing this edge colocation at the tower has any idea how a mobile network actually works like, well there's the tower put it right uh, there yeah yeah yeah. No, you exactly. have to put it at the core. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And there's only a couple cores, you know, you know Chicago. And so it's no longer there's only a couple. Right. Like, yeah. They're yeah. thinking they're thinking DIA. They're not. But even then today, the idea of, you know, the what you need to run a small business is beginning to be this hybrid of, well, maybe you've got one or two terrestrial options and you've got the cellular failover and backup. And the edge compute isn't gonna solve that. It makes a lot more sense for the MSP market where you can deploy a, a firewall and then yes. other technologies, maybe free CX or something like on that one box. Put in a cheap box and you upsell them from services. Yeah. Like it's a, I, I think it's a real market. I don't know yet whether the WISP market is going to be the one that will fully exploit it. Yeah. And secondarily, like you're just trying if they're trying to I my my talk with them um, made it kind of seem like you could deploy other people's VMs for them. Into your system, I could sell that. Hey, I have a computer. Well, that's why they were asking us, like, yeah. what is it going to take for us to deploy your scene? Or saying, well, there's parts of it, but the bare metal parts. <laughs> and there are there are bare metal orchestrators that are doing interesting things. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if software systems falls into that category. Yeah. You see, it's, it's the whole. You can get an idea real fast about the industry, but then the. Like, the difference between an industry that know, there, knows there's a problem and it's offering solutions versus. We have a solution, and now let's find the problem. Looking for the problem. Yeah. yeah. So the, the <coughs> issue that I'm seeing is it took forever for multiple different industries to move to the cloud, even at all. And I don't see any of those software vendors that are for like companies that I have to do management support for moving from one single Amazon data center and running their application in multiple even multiple other data centers. Like and that's just not happening. And so I'm, I'm, I, I struggle to see that being brought closer and closer and you know, application developers actually developing, spending the time, dev time to build that to be flexible and benefit the customer. And not just that, I think we've clearly established that cloud is not the solution to everything. Right. And yeah, and you have companies which are moving away from the cloud building your own data center and de-clouding their infrastructure. It's not as simple as everything will be or is cloud only. It never will be. Yeah. At least in my opinion. <laughs> yeah. Once again, the Whispers uh, language is actually pertinent across multiple different industries of, you know, use the right tool for the right job. Right? Yeah, definitely. And yeah, Many times cloud is not the right job. And specifically, not, not for cost saving, cloud is almost never cheaper. Almost never is cheaper. No, almost. But it can often be convenient. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are other benefits other than cost, but like it's not as simple as yeah, just let's go cloud. Yeah. That that should never be, yeah, never be the default approach. Yeah, Google Google is very happy that we pay them seven figures a year. You know, it's yeah. So all right, well, bunch of new vendors, um, some new Wis and such hitting this showroom floor. Uh, what was missing? What was new? What was missing? <laughs> well, uh, I, I'm still having, I very infrequently saw Ubiquity equipment. I was a little bit disappointed by some of the distributors carrying some of the Ubiquity stuff. Like you, you didn't think they should be showing it? Oh, no, I know. Ubiquity doesn't care about the Dizzies. Why should the Dizzies be showing off 
Ubiquity. I think it's fair to say Ubiquity doesn't care about risks about this no. entire industry, no. not just the pistons. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, I saw multiple different Ubiquity G Pond things, and it's like, hey, we have this for the Ubiquity. Stuff. There's an cool. external closure that you can put your ONT right in. Yeah, your indoor <laughs> ONT that. You <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, um, and then like, I mean, I mean, I as much as we bash Ubiquity, like they are the defining. Who everyone is going to use. Well, so, I heard from several Ubiquity diehards that they just simply can't get gear and they are legitimately implementing other things. That they have no choice. Like, it's not just the right tool for the job, but it's like, what tool can you actually get? Yeah. So, and then you're, Tom, Tomas is completely right about the, just the fact that they don't care about this market is the case. It, yeah. It, it, um, you know, I've looked at the financials lately, but years ago when the, the people started to beat that they don't care about a drum, the ISPs, you know, revenue and their statements was still more than the enterprise. More than enterprise at that point? At the time. Oh. I years thought ago, enterprise being greater than ISP was what caused them to lose interest in the industry. No. It, um, I think they lost interest in strategy and then yeah. moved on. Yeah. Oh, okay. I think. So, yeah, the whole history of it is super interesting, yeah. but yeah, as soon as you get a higher like uh, share price becomes the primary driving right. factor so of what, what they yeah. focus on and what they do and how they innovate, uh, that's when a lot of the stuff started. In, to in a sense, the providers are no longer actually the customer anymore. Yeah. Right. So, uh, who else besides Ubiquity? They um, haven't been. They haven't. I, mean, they, I, mean, I think they were sponsors of Lisp still. Oh yeah. It, Oh, it's um, it, it, um, so you know, I was gonna then segue to okay, so you know, the three large manufacturers would be Ubiquity, Cambium, and Microtech. Microtech hasn't had an official presence at WISPA ever. ever. Um, not uh, sorry, not at any other shows. Microtech just only doesn't do with the did industry shows. They right. they do did, they, did they stop doing months entirely? Yes, or not. I thought I heard the rumor they were going to pick it back up. There was a rumor that yeah, there were going there was going to be a month in uh, March or April this year in Prague, but uh, that got cancelled, and all the other micro events got cancelled for the foreseeable future. It, it um, I, uh, in one of the videos they said, but like the reason why we don't have them is that our people are so busy sourcing new components to make sure that we can sell little product that they can't go to the show and talk to you. Forrest Christian said that it has been a Massive, massive time saver. Yeah. Um, back at the pack bus. Yeah. 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 It's uh, you know, but in so while we brag on Ubiquity for not being here, Mike also is not here, but they've never been here. Right. Um, but and, what they and have, they don't have an advertising budget. Oh no, that's not true. I would say nobody is now. Yes, budget. but they yes, so they are directly engaging with the community without the mediator of of a mom or a, a Wisco show. Mm -hmm. Like they're doing far more community engagement <clears> than they used to do. It, it's a wrap. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. Yeah. laughs> so so I, I think that's such a positive sign, even mm -hmm. if you may take the absence of mums to be a negative sign. I would say I, I think they certainly have not abandoned the industry. No. 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 <laughs> they, but in a sense, maybe they just got too busy and drove beyond. Well, the thing stopped. is, they haven't changed, right? Yeah. They are doing what they have been doing yes. all of the time. Right. I mean, the marketing has changed. Yeah. The marketing oh. has changed. Yeah. Yeah. There's some new marketing, which before there was none. Before there was none. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Um, which to correct, so uh, they said that Microtech has never done a, 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 a non Microtech show. They used to. Did they? What? I think the very first um, Wisp Blues I went to had a mom attached uh, to it at the end of it, and that's where I met Greg. And it did, it's, but it's, it was it was a separate thing. It was a separate like, thing. It was at the end of the um, week, so it was like Wisp was the first half. Mm -hmm. Mom was the second half, and Ubiquity was going on at the same time as Mom. Yeah, yeah. And you had to decide if you wanted to be in the Microtech or the Ubiquity. And I think that it wasn't game, like a training session before. It was no, like actual they, had, they had the sessions going on, and they were literally down the hall. And like I think that gave Microtech a real bad sour taste for the event it, because they didn't want to compete with all that other attention going it, on. It's a, but even before that, they were official participants in what used to be called Wisp Cons. Those were in the mid two thousands, and they, because that's where I met, uh, sales Giannis. That's where I met Tully. That's where I met, they 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 were the ones that went to the show. So I met Tully 
a half dozen times before 2010. Hmm. Um, I think that's probably a different micro peak than the one. Yeah. Well, yeah. Smaller. Well, yeah. Well, yeah, like, you know, different well, yeah, like, you know, you know, it was definitely not the same organization as it is now, but they did used to do it. Um, but where they've been able to fill in and by not being here officially is through their distributors, whom they've supported really well. Um, at least from the outside. Um, however, what was to me the largest um, microtech distributor at the Wisp shows d- didn't have a booth at all. Yeah, they had bought one and then didn't show up. Yeah, so which is and yeah, they didn't show. Uh-huh. Yeah, well, I mean, and there's a sign saying where they should have been. Yeah, that's a Baltic. <laughs> uh, well, a few of the uh, the previous employees showed up. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> in their new roles. Yeah. 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 I, mean, so the faces, I say this in every show, but the faces stay the same. The names on the shirts change. Mm-hmm. So, definitely a lot of, a lot of movement. Uh, we'll be seeing probably some movement out of the Mimosa guys. Uh, Baltics going around. We'll see what other vendors recently kind of disappeared. Um, Sergon had a guy suitcase in their house. Oh, did they? Yeah. It's interesting because they're being bought by ABX. So I don't know why they're even. That's interesting. And and CI had a booth again. Oh yeah, which is weird. That's weird because he's been suitcasing for a little while. So, no, oh, whatever. That's them. So all right, probably about time to wrap it up because I'd like to go get some food. Yep. Um, time for dinner. Yeah. Time for dinner. What would you guys say would be the uh, cool thing to see at Wispa Palooza? The guys again. Yeah, it'd be cool. Aww. 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 You're so sweet. The group hug. <laughs> I love you too. And you guys, if you make it out. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Make it out. It's a super fun show. Nerd fest yeah. galore. Like, you sit down and I just, I'm talking to people about all sorts of really cool things and ideas. And everyone's super approachable and willing to talk about but, everything. But we need a way to replicate the experience of the. Um, it was like I like that at the Rio, at the Circle Bar, and downstairs at the Marriott all this week, where you couldn't walk but hitting bumping elbows with wisps, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. It got a little rowdy one night, I heard, but you know, it was people were putting the place to bed at one two a.m. every night. Yeah. Every Only morning. because they closed. If Only they because they closed. closed. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I think one of our team, and no, one of our, one of our customers, we got back to bed like at four forty five, and it must have gone somewhere. But, um, yeah. That's the thing that I think we I'd like to see happen in Vegas, and I don't know how because there isn't a venue for it. It's split up between the different hotels, and the casino is there. Like, yeah, the casino. So we we uh, you know we've been hosting an open bar. This is our second time. We did that on Monday, kind of an open starter show. You know, people who are here early and just come by. You don't have to be a customer, and that was really fun. Again, we had I think more people than we did in Vegas, which is great because yeah, it's a smaller show. show. Yeah, it'll probably be bigger again in Vegas. We'll do do something again, but. Maybe well, we need to bring back the hospitality suite. Who can We're say no to the open bar? You can say no to the open bar, but it's also the conversation. Like, yeah. we really, maybe we need to get you know, you know, share the sponsorship with a few people, but because there hasn't been a hospitality suite for a couple shows now, right? Twenty nineteen, I remember there was one, but I, there wasn't. Uh, we got to do that again because there's so many great conversations that happen when you can just get together and, and be it, together. Yeah, it's um, and I, I do want to have the caveat that uh, this seems to be centric about bars and. You know, drinking and whatnot. But yesterday, I had I think five drinks all day, and I still got to bed at one thirty or two o'clock. So it wasn't that I was drinking, and getting hammered all night. No, like, no. Like it was, no. Just, it was just a, a nice little social lubricant. Yes, that exactly. You have a beer. Yeah. You space it out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, and, and <laughs> yeah, the conversations really were right. really good. Uh, I like this year the bowling. That was fun. I didn't get to stay for that. I mean, we did some customer appreciation dinners, but um, it so looked I like saw. a lot of fun. So I yeah. saw. Well, are you a customer yet? <laughs> My table was the table was there. Yeah, yeah. Were I will say, for those of you who have not met uh, Hammett's little boy, he is every bit as delightful as advertised and probably more. Yeah. I, I was waiting you to say he's every bit as nice as his dad. No, I was, no, yeah, no. I was, I was gonna so say much, yeah. Yeah. all the little shortcomings. <laughs> yeah. He gave them. He, he, he gave the benefits to his son. His son's adorable. He's very adorable. adorable. Because yeah. I was gonna challenge you. I, what I really like about the Knights of the Nerdy dads are the best. You know, trying to teach their kids something and 
Mike kept bringing them over to me, you know, to kind of look at the mustache, and, and he wasn't sure what to make of me at first. Like, he was a little bit, you know, he wasn't, he didn't look worried or sad, but he was just kind of thinking about it. <laughs> and, then, and then after a few more times, he started to lighten up. Oh, he yeah, he was social. Right? He, was, he was able to brighten up, so we, we worked out. He was yeah. good. All right, catch you guys in the next show. Have fun. Catch you all later. Thanks. Bye. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I guess, how do people reach you guys? <laughs> you put that in there. Yeah, I'll put that at the bottom. Yeah. yeah, Facebook.